talk animals because I know Linda Benson, uh, the author, is is probably going to be listening to this, and she's probably pulling her hair out at this point, going, "Rob, ask her about the animal characters." So, <laughs> Without delay, Kathy Appelt, master animal character writer. What is the secret to writing a great animal character? Okay, well, I don't know if it's a secret, but um, for me, when I'm writing a, an animal character, um, I, you know, I do, I actually do research on that animal. I mean, I can't tell you how, how much I researched raccoons when I was writing the uh, Sugar Man Swamp, you know, the True Blue Scouts. Um, because you know, I mean, I mean, I just needed to know, you know, like what they were capable of, as far as you know, like with raccoons, for example, you know, what were they capable of? Well, they can really, really climb, and uh, you know, they they swim. They, you know, they're gregarious, and they can squeeze. They they can like bend their bodies into tight places in ways that other. It's like their backbone is really flexible. So, so these are things that I didn't know, you know, before I wrote the book. So. I always start out really researching the animal itself and what what species it, it's it's in and what you know what what animal strata you know what what's its species what who's it related to um, I study where they're from you know if if they're um, indigenous to the area or if they've been introduced I study what they eat and um, you know. And then in usually in my research, I always find little odd things, little anecdotes usually about a particular animal, like some experience that somebody's had with them. Not that that makes it into my book, but um, so I really, you know, do, it seems it's, it's, it, you know, it seems unnecessary in so many ways. I mean, a raccoon's a raccoon, right? But, um, but the other thing that's important, okay. So you have animal characters and, and for the purposes of fiction, for the most part, um, you have to endow them with human feelings and emotions, right? So that so that we can really understand there's there's still a character, and in some ways, they're placeholders for a human, and so so they still have to be endowed with um, you know, feelings of joy and sorrow and wonder and, you know, all those, all those things. But you have to always keep in mind that those are imposed upon the animal from the author. So as an author, I impose those, those characteristics upon a, you know, an animal. But the, the main thing to remember is that, okay, you've got this placeholder character who is actually human you know, is it has human emotions, human feelings, uh, human needs, but it's not quite human. And so the the tricky part then is to um, make sure that you still maintain the ish, what I call the ish factor, the I S H factor, and that is with a raccoon, for example. I have to be sure that the character is still raccoonish you know like okay he's the the scouts for example were really you know they were brothers and they you know they were really kind of like i envisioned them kind of as like fourth or fifth graders you know age wise and emotion wise and capability wise and all of that but because they were raccoons they had this kind of flexibility and freedom that a real fourth or fifth grader, a human wouldn't have, you know, they wouldn't be out in the swamp by themselves, but maturity wise, that's kind of the level they were. So, um, so I'm not sure if this is making sense, but when I'm writing an animal character, I have to remember that they're a placeholder for largely a placeholder. Also that they, um, they, they have to have, emotions and feelings and all of that. And then finally that they maintain that ish factor. So if I'm writing a bear, it still has to be bear ish. You know, you still have to have a bear that growls, you know, a bear that is, you know, that could eat you <laughs> if it had the uh, inclination, you know, that sort of thing. So so I don't know if that's helpful, but that that's, you know, that's the approach I take. 
So I was hoping you were going to tell me that you maybe put on a raccoon suit and go outside and and dig through garbage and, and do the do the furry <laughs> all for do the furry what are those things those guys that do that called the furry <laughs> oh, the, no, yeah, no, the furries. that would not be me no but it's you know it's kind of fun imagining you know what it must be like to uh, to be a raccoon or a snake. And one of the nice things about, really one of the great things about writing animal characters is that you do get this viewpoint that you wouldn't as a human, like, you know, a snake character is right there at ground level. So a snake is going to like be looking up through the flowers, you know, to see the sky, you know, unless you get down on the ground and, you know, and look up through the flowers, you that's a point of view that most of us never have. So the, uh, like, and my, like my little raccoon, um, you know, he bingo was just dying to climb to the top of the loblolly pine tree. It was, you know, mission pine tree, mission loblolly or whatever it was. Uh, and, and, and that was his, you know, his goal in life was to get to the top of that tree. And, um, you know, humans not very many humans climb to to the top of trees some do but not very many so but lots of raccoons do <laughs> they're great climbers so you get to you know see the world from the top of the tree that gives you a you know a perspective a point of view that you wouldn't if you were um you know if you were uh writing it from a human point of view with zora the um the little ocelot in animal thieves, you know, she's the, she, I used her, um, as, as a, as the tie, you know, she, um, uh, she's, she was at one time indigenous to the area to Houston, the area that Houston now sits on. There were lots of ocelots there at one time, uh, but she's no longer there. There are no, there are no longer any ocelots in or, or if they are there's, I mean, it's, impossible really that if, if they're there it's because somebody captured one and set them set her loose um so um there, i'm sure there are also lots in houston but they're they're pets or trapped or whatever anyway so um but because she was there at the time of the backstory that there were also lots there and now you know i have her in the current day the, the real time story she serves as a kind of bridge between the previous story that's set in 1830s and the and the current real time story, so I use her as a bridge to say this is what was, once was, and now this is this is happening now. And you know, and the only way that an ocelot would be uh, present in my story is if she were captured or being or being used as an exotic pet, and um, and so. And so what I wanted to do in that case was show, you know, show the, the, um, the state really that, um, yes, we have this, this brilliant urban setting, this beautiful city and Houston is a really wonderful city, but it came at a cost, you know, it came at a cost. And so the cost now is, with this animal, you know, the question becomes, now what, you know, now what do we do? What do we do with this information? And, and how are we as humans going to respond? And so that was Cade's, you know, Cade had to respond, you know, we hope that he responded well to her situation. So, and, you know, she also was bio level, you know, she was at the level of the bio throughout the story. So we're seeing the bio as, as the bio, rolls by.